when you get to know somebody, it's harder to be angry with them, you know, walk a mile in somebody's shoes. Do you think that that's what writing does, that, that you need to empathise? Is it kind of like being a parent, you have to love all of your characters? Oh, well, I, I, I do think so. I mean, I can think of books that I've written uh, where I've begun to be by being angry with a character. <laughs> and mm. um, well, it's never going to work until you find it in your heart to understand them. Because mm. otherwise you're going to be always outside them and always judging them and it's not going to be satisfactory. And, and as somebody who, who, who teaches you know, writing in New York, less with the students I have now, I must say, but the ones I used to have, you know, you'd, you'd see student after student who were in a rage basically with their mummy or their daddy and, and it was being sort of acted out on the page in some sort of a way and they were un unable to get beyond their own personal anger to invent a character who had any complexity and depth uh, because they really couldn't find a way to love them. Uh, I, I think we have to do that. Find a way to love them. Mm -hmm. Do you do that through the writing? Yeah. Well, do you find your way, you find your way to doing it, I think, by asking yourself, you know, how in the hell this person, why, I, I want people to do things, often for very unreasonable reasons, you know, just because I want them to do a thing, and mm. then you think, well, why would someone do something like that, and who are they that, would, that, that they would do that, and if they're doing something unpleasant, who are they, and, and a lot of the process of writing is just continuing to ask yourself why the character is doing something, and in answering that, uh, you actually finally find a character, I think, with some depth. The characters that are doing things mm -hmm. almost for their own reasons, not because the author wanted them to. It, actually, it strikes me that throughout the course of your writing, you don't take the easy option. You're quite a risk taker. And I mean, I imagine that choosing somebody from history, especially somebody who's taught on the curriculum, albeit whether or not mm. people actually read <laughs> him, um, but, it, but through the course of all of your novels, you've been a big risk taker. Do you think that that's part of the role of a novelist? Do you see yourself as a risk taker? Oh, yes. Uh, I'm also a very nervous person, so it's a weird combination, you know. Yeah. You sort of take, take, on, take on this big risk, and, and uh, which I sort of love. I mean, I really lo I mean, writing Jack Maggs and messing with Dickens was sort of fun. Mm. And, and if you write about Ned Kelly, you know that even though all your friends think it's a very boring idea because everybody knows all about Ned Kelly. But you know it's a sort of a slightly dangerous thing to mess with. And that's sort of attractive and interesting and stimulating and frightening. Mm. And, but it doesn't stop you being... <laughs> you know, I mean, I do remember arriving in London for the pu publication of Jack Maggs and thinking, holy shit, what have I done? Because <laughs> uh, it's, you know, their writer, their place, mm. uh, and so on. But it is also what I like. Are you ever scared of those sort of Sunday afternoon readers who are like cross-examining the little facts? And oh, but see, well, firstly, they're not reading. Mm. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and secondly, I've got it covered. <laughs> <laughs> But, but it's sort of the least of it, really. But yes, but I, but I have got it covered, and actually I, I get some glee in covering. See, if you, if you read True History of the Kelly Gang, mm. no matter how much of it is made up, I've used pretty much everything that is known, and the things that are known are not really changed too much. It's really what, what's invented is in the dark, unknown mm. part beyond the police reports uh, mm. uh, and the newspaper accounts. Sometimes it seems as though there is a fine line in perception between snobbery and the ability to critically differentiate. Do you think that this is more apparent now? I don't know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, I uh, tell me, but I'm... Uh, well, it was something that, that Olivier made me think of. You mean Olivier is snobbish? And Olivier is sort of saying, oh, well, this is ridiculous. You, you people can't possibly have a decent culture because, um, you know, you haven't studied enough and you don't know enough and really it's not your job. And it's really my job and my class's job to do this, that sort of thing. I like the voice that you put on <laughs> It's just come alive for me. Um, and that that seems to be close to a part of an argument in the book 
which is to relating to his fear of, 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 of democracy of and the rule, of the, the rule of the majority and his, mm, the fear his proprietorial, but yeah, not, not sure about art and culture. Mm. And, yeah, yeah. Well, here's, here's the, he, firstly, he's snobbish, yes. Mm. Secondly, I think if you look at the book and you think of, talking, of, of Olivier talking about visual art, I think I don't think he really knows very much myself. So, you know, the, the, the book sort of undercuts his own argument at that point. And although he worries about, on the one, he worries about the impossibility of uh, art in a democracy, on the other hand, the whole book itself is a product of art in a democracy mm. when we discover who wrote it. Mm. So the book is a, and, and so when we're talking about his snobbishness, there is a sort of, I hope, a very active argument going on. And everybody's positions are sort of undercut in mm. some way. And although we, we think Parrot, Parrot, who's sort of more like us, has to be right, at the end we might think, well, maybe he's not exactly right. And maybe this French aristocratic snob who we sort of amused by and sometimes touched by and care about, but still is who he is, maybe actually he's got an uncomfortable point to make. Mm -hmm. So it's that sort of active engagement with those things that interests me. So I think, you know, if you want to go beyond Olivier's character, and if you want to look at an argument that says, uh, you know, that uh, there is a risk that in a market-driven democracy we will be ruled by the mob and the opinion, the uninformed opinions mm. of the mob. Um, and if I'd been arguing with him, I would have said, well, we're going to be educated. It's not going to be a mob. It's going to be an electorate and everyone will, you know. Mm. But if you, if you look at what we've actually done, we have, a, you know, we, we have allowed ourselves with our laziness about the, the lack of value that we place on education mm. and the great number of children who come out of school not being able to read properly mm. and the fact that we have given up the ability, uh, the, 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 the important of putting a sufficient value on being able to read and think, mm. which you, you will get from the written word in a way that you will, you get many things from film and theater and whatever, but from the written word you'll get all these things. So we'll look at all of that and we'll think, well, you know, maybe this snobbish Frenchman actually has something to tell us. Mm. Not that we should go back to a monarchy. Oh. <laughs> Um, anyway, <laughs> you take my point. Uh, we don't want to go back to the present. <laughs> uh, we don't want to go. We, we don't want to go back to that sort of situation. But maybe we can think about if we are to have a democracy, that it's we have a responsibility to educate our people properly. Mm -hmm. Scar scary Sarah Palin. Mm. is really something well, scary mm. and, um, and that, a lot of that you know, comes from fear of social change of course but it comes from people who have been neglected and people have not been educated mm. and people have, whose jobs are in danger and so on and so on. So education I think is very 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 important and will not our heads but you know, if, 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 if we really believed, if we really, really believed that illiteracy and stupidity were life-threatening, what would we do? What, what do you think that we can do about it? Well, Well, I think the first thing is to acknowledge that we have sort of somehow accepted mm. that sort of reading is somehow too hard. Mm. Um, and that, I mean, I've read this thing in, in, in the New York Times by this very intelligent guy, Nick Christoph, who was reporting without any disapproval of 
the problem of getting boys to read, which seems to be more difficult than getting mm -hmm. girls to read. And that really in order to get boys to read, you needed something more sort of active and something, you know. So there was sort of, you know, books with, books about ghosts, books about ultimate wrestling, and books with at least one explosion. So if you're really going to get into a, into, into a thing of teaching kids to read, and you're going to start getting into this, um, it seems to me exceptionally dangerous. You, you, what you're going to do is you're going to teach them, and books with, with, with limited vocabularies, you know, like a vocabulary of, I don't know what it is. So, and I know this is rubbish because I have a very, very, very old close friend in New York, Canadian guy called Stephen Half, who really is one of those gifted people who can teach, who enjoys teaching and the challenge of teaching poor, disaffected kids. And, you know, he's white. Most of the kids, all of the kids he's teaching are black and poor and neglected and abused and haven't had a chance. And he is a genius at it. Mm. And this guy, this strange, fair-haired, worried white man from Canada took these kids, and they really literally were ghetto kids, mm. and had them studying Romeo and Juliet. And they really got it. They ended up taking their production of Romeo and Juliet all around the world. And these are people that the, the New York public school system doesn't like Stephen Half, mm. <laughs> and the New York public school system didn't like these kids. But my point is, they, can, they could do it. Everything in life is against them. And he's doing it again. And I, I'm, I met with some of these kids uh, a couple of weeks ago. Mm. And one of these boys, whose name is Ernesto, is there reading True History of the Kelly Gang. Um, is sort of really astonishing. Uh, so what I mean is kids who've been left out are stretching their minds because they want to, they're reading beyond their experience, they're reading beyond their vocabulary, they're reading Shakespeare and they're reading True History of the Kelly Gang. We can teach people to read. Mm. We just are not committed to doing it. Mm. I mean, I know that when you're not writing, you're the executive director of the Master of Fine Arts in Creative Writing at Hunter University in New York. And bar. <laughs> yes. I mean, in general, are you optimistic about the state of tertiary education? Oh, I don't know very much about it. I, I mean, I know about my, uh, the, the people that I teach, and, and uh, they're sort of extraordinary. You know, uh, they tend to be older rather than younger. And right. they're people, mm -hmm. that have, people that have decided to risk their lives to try and be a writer, you know, at the age of 26 when they've tried something else, or 30, or 32. When you said older, I thought you meant older than that. 26. I meant just old in comparison to myself. Uh, <laughs> do you, do you, I mean, it's the age-old question about creative writing programs. Would you, if you were starting out now, would you go and do one? I'd be very scared. Um, I did actually, I applied twice for the Stanford Writing Scholarship at, here at in Melbourne. Shame on you, Stanford Writing Scholarship. Well, it was, it was the academics of Melbourne who, 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 of course, actually gave it to someone who had a university degree, and why wouldn't they? Not someone who'd sort of failed everything he'd done. Um, I bet they're cursing themselves I, right now. Hard, hard thing to do from the grave, I think. <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> I, it's hard to imagine you ever as a cadet novelist, but if you can go back to then, would, is there, do you have any words that you would tell yourself, words of advice on the writing life? On, on no. I mean, it would have... I mean, I think all the, the, the thing that one basically... The, the single most important quality to have if you're going to be a writer, I think, is simply a great deal of will uh, or uh, obsession or something like that which is really the single thing you need to keep you going because it takes a long 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 time to learn to do it and you need to be somehow stupid enough to or 
blind enough to mm. think that the world needs you when it already has, you know, Proust and Conrad and, and then just a lot of will to keep on going and optimism. And I think that that's the quality that it, when you're recruiting for a writing program, I, when I started off, I'd just be looking at the, at the work mm. and that's very important. I mean, you can, it's quite clear when people have talent, but then there's, people can have a lot of talent and really not have the will and the grit for the thing. And so I've, you know, one starts to pay more attention to that, that other quality. But if you're the person doing it, you can't give yourself will and you can't know how much will you've mm. got. So there's no way of knowing. Mm. You just do it. And also in this whole business, you know, if I, I once taught in a, a summer program in Canada and this guy said, well, I don't know why everyone's talking about this whole thing about how to get agents and, and, and publish and all of this sort of thing because I really like doing this and if I don't get published, I'm not going to stop. And if I was a painter and I enjoyed painting every weekend, no one would think it was weird at all. Uh, and I thought that was a really you know, sane point. People do it because... Um, we all have dreams all the time, and, and, and mm. they're, they're an important part of the process, I think, too. Is that willfulness in life ever a problem? No. <laughs> <laughs> As a big reader, do you have books that you return to again and again? Yes, yeah, some. I mean, there's some... They change, you know. I mean, there, there are, there are. I've probably read Portrait of a Lady three or four times. Mm -hmm. Henry James, uh, W. G. Siebold, you know, wrote Austerlitz, which I think is one of, of the people. And, and I met him once only, and he died tragically. Not long after that, and I was so shy around his. I mean, he's a genius. He's a great writer of our age, and I'm sad every time I think about him that he died. Mm -hmm. But I think Austerlitz is just a great, great book. I taught it for a whole semester. We dissected the book, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I said exercises from it. And at the end, the students, I asked them if they could draw a map of, of, of this very yeah, quite complicated, lovely work of art. And one of them produced the most beautiful thing, like like like, like a, a map of the London Underground, you know, with all the different themes and dates and characters and things. So anyway, I think that's a I, I love, and every time I read it, it's new, and every time I read it, I find out something more. And, and of course, he's no way like me, but I like I mm. love uh, anyway. Yes, is the answer. <laughs> that's what I want. One word answer. Yeah. My introduction to you was in high school with short stories. Do you ever find yourself returning to that form? No, I, I, I don't because I think... I wrote those short stories. I, I'd written three, three or four, I can't really count, novels. I don't know quite how to count. Um, <laughs> but certainly I think you know, I'd, I'd had big ambitions for things and mm. by the time after a, a year or two years I, I would realise I'd failed. And I was sick of failing, and I'd been, it seemed like I'd been writing a long time. I'd probably been writing for about six years or something. And I came, I'd been in England, I came back, and I just started writing those short stories. And it was the first time anything really started to work. And um, so it was a huge pleasure. You know, it was just like I'd write a short story one week, and two weeks later I'd write another one, and then I'd write another one, and I'd write another one. Um, I. I think if I wrote a short story now, I wouldn't have another idea. Uh, and, and so in a, in a weird way, you know, to, to, when one gets into a novel, one gets into a big, big adventure. Mm -hmm. And one has the idea and the amount of discovery you're going to make and the things you're going to find out and the richness for me is enormous. So it d doesn't really bear comparison mm -hmm. with the rewards for me of a short story. But the short stories which people... Uh, are often very affectionate about and indeed teach and sometimes kids like them are for me a source of considerable confusion uh, because when I go back to look at them um, I think they're you know, really you know, a, a young somebody with a vocabulary of about five words and, <laughs> and uh, 
which are inevitably repeated a great deal. <laughs> and, um, and indeed, when I'd finished Patrick, uh, Patrick, uh, Parrot and Olivier, I, I, I'd, I'd sworn I would go back and line edit these stories. <laughs> Not to change you know, the young man who wrote them, but just mm. to do what should have been done at the time if I'd not been so arrogant. Uh, and, and I spent three days line editing the stories and at the end of it I looked at them and really basically they were still the same stories <laughs> and it wasn't worth the work and I sort of wish in a way they were out of print and then <laughs> you have to get better surely mm. and so I feel like that about them I feel a little bit embarrassed and then I feel pleased when people like them <laughs> But, I mean, you bring up the subject of editing and I imagine being single-minded and having a good idea of being a bit of a control freak, in fact, is a little bit of the writer's job. When you're yeah. being edited, do you... What's it like for you and has it changed? I, I don't like the construction <laughs> being edited. Um, <laughs> do you... I, 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 it doesn't feel good to me. But, <laughs> but, 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 on the other hand, I'm much more, much more on your side than you think. Um, because when I, when I was, uh, actually, the first novel I had published was Bliss. And, um, it wasn't the first novel you wrote. No, it was about the fourth novel I wrote. And uh, I remember talking to my, my then editor at Faber, Robert McCrum. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's amazing, you know, given you know, the amount of editorial work I'm doing now. And with Bliss, I just wrote it in a year and, and I remember we went and we ha all had dinner and we drank so much, much that the CEO, Matthew Evans, woke up the next morning and thought he'd had a stroke. <laughs> and, and, um, and I went into the, into the Faber office with an awful hangover and rewrote a paragraph. <laughs> and he said, Peter, when the manuscript arrived, this was in the days when you had things professionally typed, you know, he said it had been not only professionally typed, it had been bound and it had, don't fuck with this, written all over it. <laughs> um, so, you know, when that's a young person really determined not to be messed with by anyone. But as you get older, you realize that it doesn't really do you any discredit to listen to all sorts of people mm. and that you can learn a great deal. It's not like that. So, and there is this question of, you know, you say being edited and I prickle and, and Yet, I've had all sorts of uh, people, uh, like in this, this most recent book was read by an, an editorial from about five different people. Mm. And, you know, first of all, you know, I'm married to one called Francis Cody, who's a fantastic editor and publisher of, of, of a Picador in the US. And mm. she edits a lot of really, really, you know, great writers. So I'm blessed by that, and we go through that, and, and at a certain time will come and she'll say, well, how do you want me to read this? And I say, well, I don't want the truth. <laughs> but at a certain time will come, I'll say, yes, I do want the truth. And, and mm -hmm. then we'll, you know, she'll be flagging the pages. So I, I went through that with her. Then I handed it in, and there's Ben Ball here. Mm -hmm. who had a whole lot of things to say. Sonny Mater in New York had a whole lot of things to say. In fact, I turned up to lunch with Sonny Mater and I, I, I thought by then, I'm not going to listen to anybody. And, and so I went to, there's a little Japanese store called, called Muji and they're tiny notebooks. So I went to Muji and I bought the smallest notebook I could find. <laughs> Are they really this? Really tiny oh. and a pen. And so we met in a restaurant and I put it on the table. <laughs> And I said, I'm ready to listen. <laughs> but he had a lot of things to say, and they were really good. And then we had, and I handed it, and he had more things to say. And so the things that once would have made me sort of homicidal or suicidal, um, I think are gifts. And uh, I'm really, really happy to engage. I don't feel in the tiniest bit diminished, and I don't feel like I'm being edited. <laughs> That's the trick. The editor's trick is not to make you feel like yeah, you're the being Yeah, that's edited. exactly the editor's trick. It, mm. it, quite right. The editor's trick is to make you feel it's your idea. The editor's thing, it's like the director's trick. It's to direct without mm. people feeling they're being controlled. And uh, writers have other tricks too. 
<laughs> to make the editor feel like they actually did anything at all. <laughs> well, writers always have the, the, the great, great talent, you know, in the end, you know, for completely forgetting any help they had from anybody <laughs> in public. <laughs> <laughs> and only the editor knows, you see. <laughs> and they live with it, don't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the creation of and the value that we give art is one of the themes I read in this book. And it reminded me of the different kinds of values that we, as the co-producers, and I speak as a publisher now, put on art. For example, publishers can access data uh, that will tell us how many copies of an author's book have sold and decisions about publication can be based on that information if we so mm. please. Manuscripts that have been rejected can be accepted by the same publishing house after they've in the meantime won prestigious unpublished manuscript mm. awards. Writers can become very pragmatic about this or they can become quite up upset about it. Where do you stand on... Upset about... <laughs> what? You mean the, the lack of ab a sense of absolute value for mm. the publishing house? Mm. Oh. And in general? Well, I mean, it depends. I mean, I think the, the, a publishing, the publishing house has to stay solvent and the publishing house also should, um, if the publishing house is more than a you know, sausage factory, mm. the, the publishing house should have a responsibility to publish things that they know they're going to lose money on and they'll try and balance it, one would hope, you know, somewhere mm. else and be able to do that. Mm. I think that sort of publishing house that you're talking about um, seems very sweet. And what I think about when I think about more about the business decisions of publishing now is and the, the way it has become uh, increasingly that the big decisions have been, are really being made by people who really don't read. Mm. And they're people, yeah, they're, they're, in other words, you know, like in everything else, you, you have sort of managers. Mm. And, the ma ma and the job of the manager isn't to read the book. The job of the managers is to look at the numbers, mm. to look at how many were sold of this last time, to let you know, a sort of a, a weird sort of statistical determinism creep into mm. publishing. And that's, that and then the role of the, within that sort of relation, within the role of the editor and the passionate publisher who reads and can take a bet, mm. you know, like a, a, a good old capitalist entrepreneurial bet mm. uh, gets more and more diminished. Uh, so this is not to really address you the question particularly, but it's to talk to something that I'm very interested in. <laughs> <laughs> That's allowed. But so those, those within the mix of the realities of you know, modern corporate business, you know, the role of the entrepreneurial editor-publisher mm -hmm. becomes very, 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 very important. And when you get an organisation where those people don't have any power or any strength or are not listened to, you know, then we're all dead in the water. Mm. Um, so I'm, I guess the thing that I, I you know, it, we, we have to want publishers to stay in business. And we, ha we have to understand that if the publisher judges that they can't afford to publish a book, mm. we have to, I suppose, accept that we understand that somehow and that mm. we'll have to publish it another way. You know, we'll have to publish it online or we'll have to publish it on toilet paper or something. Mm. Yeah. I think I've got books that were published on toilet paper. Actually, they're, they're, they're a bit old now, but you can get them online. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they met the price points. <laughs> that, I think that even though this is the age of digital publishing and e-books, mm. so we're told, and none of us quite know what that is going to mean, but the rollout's happening, do you... I think that writers still, when they write a book, they're still seeing their book, the end result, in terms of paper. Oh, I think so too. And also, who is really telling us? I'm, I mean, I, I'm not saying that the technology will not allow us to pleasantly read in the future, mm. and maybe it will, but it won't necessarily. And just because something's been invented, and you know, it doesn't really mean you know, that. Uh, I mean, maybe. 
all the lessons we'd learned from the Industrial Revolution were not absolutely correct. And, and, and the people that are really, really, really fired up about digital publishing and electronic publishing and all this sort of thing, they're not people who read, really. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> They might, they might be retailers or they might be publishers or they might be people who are part of a publishing enterprise. Um, so you, maybe don't have, you don't have a Kindle? You don't have an iPad? I've got a space onion. A space onion? Is that a real thing? <laughs> it is now. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Carey's space onion. So you can't, in the foreseeable future you don't see yourself with a I, I don't, in a funny way, that I, I don't really sort of, I don't care too much really mm. one way or the other mm. about that. What I care about is people being able to read mm. and people who make decisions about publishing books and selling books, mm. actually reading them. They're the things I care about. It's nice to hear your passion. Edmund... <laughs> <laughs> Edmund White, in his review in the Daily Telly, says he is the most exuberant stylist at work in English today. Mm. And James Wood, in last week's New Yorker, said there are few contemporary writers with such a sure sense of narrative pungency and immediacy. So I'm interested in when you've written a book, do you feel as though you've achieved your aim? And when you look through your old books, if you ever do, do you ever pick them up and have a look through and think? that was good or, oh God. I used to. I, 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 I used to sometimes try to look through my old books for when I was stuck at something and look for some sort of comfort. Mm. And I'd either think, that, decide that they were crap or I'd decide, so it gave me no comfort at all, or I'd decide they were, they were much better than anything I could do now. So, <laughs> so I thought maybe I should just stop doing that and, 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 and pretty much I have. Um, yeah, you know, one should never underestimate the grandiosity <laughs> of a writer uh, or the ambition and dreams of a writer and you know, they, they have to be really considerable and mm. they're not to be really gone into in a public space, I don't think. <laughs> um, I mean, there are, there, are, there are books I've written that, of which this is one and True History of the Kelly Gang is another that when I'd finished it I thought I'd done something substantial. On the other hand, when I'd finished Oscar and Lucinda, I thought I'd done something that was sort of so boringly within my range that no one was really going to like it. And, and not only that, but the title was boring. And um, <laughs> so I guess one doesn't know. On life's great tick list, are there any things that haven't yet been achieved for you in the writing sphere? Oh, writing's never like that. I think it's really, I mean, when, if you're a writer, you're really. The thing that's deeply satisfying and horrifying and is the business of writing. And I think you know the great. It's not, it's really wonderful to have to, to win a prize, and it's really, of course, one wants good reviews. Mm. You know, and the, the rage <laughs> at bad reviews and things still you know don't go away. Um, mm. But the real pleasure of it is actually doing the work, and it's and and and, and I continue to think you know, what a really, really privileged existence it is. So the thing about what you want, what you really, really want is the next day's work, you know, and to, mm. and, and to work and, and, and when you have a day, you have a lot of rotten days, of course, but you have a lot of, some days when you feel that you've really made something really beautiful that you didn't even know about before, that never existed before. And I think that's just heaven. I mean, what a way to live your life. That's great. <laughs>